I crouched at the lock of the Zebra Police Station's contraband vault, thinking as I worked. Pinkie Pie took surprise parties to a whole new level. I found myself thinking of the party trap on the roof of the GRHAS building, wondering what sort of party she might have been setting up. Uh, welcome back, sorry for the alligators that they bit your leg, party for one of the hatchery staff, perhaps? Or merely a birthday party for someone working there? Or maybe just a birthday party for one of the alligators? I shook my head. No, I couldn't imagine even Pinkie Pie would throw a party for an alligator. That would just be silly. The tumblers moved into place, and the door opened. I stepped inside, turning the light to my pit buck, and taking a deep breath, as I enjoyed the stale, yet pink-free air inside. My eyes fell on the weapons, and I stopped, stunned. Whoa, Nelly! Calamity whimpered, and I could only nod. I was pretty sure the zebras had never supposed to have this kind of armament, and if the ponies of Cantalot had ever seen what well, the striped equestrian citizens had just beneath them were stockpiling something like this, they was fixing to fend off an invasion, Clementy said softly. Zenith nodded. Most likely, they feared the ponies of Cantalot would eventually come for them. The guns are in real bad condition, Clementy said regretfully, but I reckon I can fix up some of the good ones right out of the parts. Maybe about two dozen. Take them all, I said, suddenly getting an idea. I started unlocking one of the weapon lockers. Everything you can get to repair into something good. A moment later, I had the locker open and was staring at the thing inside. Zenith peeked out over my shoulder and said simply, Bellfire Egg Launcher. A what? I rocked on my hooves. Sure enough, one of the ammo boxes I unlocked later held several Bellfire eggs. Taking them, I floated up the BEL. I'll be right back, I told the others before creeping back into the pink. A few moments later, I made my way back to the hallway. The alicorns were still talking inside. I stepped around the corner as sats activated, and was pleased to see one of the alicorns was a purple one, with a recognizable set of wounds. Gotcha. From the Journal of Midnight Shower, Day 32. I received an official decree from Princess Luna today, in response of my letter's reports. By this document of authority, signed by the princess herself, the local constabulary is required to let me interview any prisoner in his custody. I noticed an oddness about the town. It was as if the entire place was abandoned. All the stores were mysteriously closed, and I proceeded directly to the Zebratown police station, only to find the door shut and locked from the inside. It occurred to me that today must be some zebra holiday, considering the dark and ominous tones and most of the mythology, it does stand to reason that their holidays would be just as somber and fearful affairs. Although, even then, the closing of the police offices seemed exponential. Point would never shut down vital services just because of a date on the calendar. In my dream, I was little Pip, the zebra. I trotted about the zebra city, not zebra town which attempted to blend zebra heritage with equestrian aesthetics, but a real zebra city. A city formed into a hillside. A forest with trees themselves molded into homes and buildings after their roots had been tended with the most ancient and sacred of magical brews. Their homes were marked with masks and friendship, or masks of friendship and welcome. There were no fences, just carvings blessing the home and warning off monsters. Gardens of vegetables and herbs stretched out from each home, and flasks hung from their branches. I wasn't sure how I knew this was what a proper zebra city looked like. Be smart, but I knew it all the same. I looked up at the bright starry night, and smiled at the moon. My eyes caught a streak in the sky. I blinked, unaware of what I had seen. There was another, 
One of the stars had fallen from the sky. I heard gasps and murmurs of the other zebras around me. I had not been the only one to see it. Other zebras, my friends and neighbors, were staring out into the sky. Their eyes were wide as the stars fell, some of them streaking through the air towards us before winking out. One particularly bright star fell from the heavens and did not wink out. Instead, it slammed into our forest with a flash of light and sound and dirt, blasting apart homes and shaking the ground beneath us. The stars were attacking us. Another star fell from the sky, tearing a great fiery swath into the city, murdering dozens of my fellow zebras. Now there was panic. The streets were filled with my neighbors as they fled from their huts, not knowing which way to run. I felt the ground shake from another impact. The forest was burning now. I looked up, horrified. My hoofs were freezing, refusing to move, as if I was glued to the ground. Another star, the brightest yet, tore from his rightful place in the night sky, shooting down right at me. I awoke with a gasp. I looked around at the rubble. Blowing up the three alicorns with a bellfire egg was delicious overkill. One of them had even been fast enough to get her damn shield up before I could fire. It didn't help one bit. But I had been unprepared for how big the explosion would be. I'd been cautious, aiming for the wall behind the alicorns. That wall was no longer there. Nor was the floor. Or ceiling. The room the alicorns, alicorns had occupied was nothing was well as, as well as the rooms on each side had become a gaping maw open to the rain. I had fired and dived back behind the wall. That wall had blown into the hallway, collapsing, trapping me between it and the other. I checked the medical assist spell and was surprised to find that, while battered and bruised, nothing was broken. I was lucky that I wasn't a smear. I looked around. The BEL lay crushed under a chunk of wall. It was worthless now, although Calamity might be able to strip parts from it to repair another, should we ever find one. I concentrated, wrapping the concrete chunk in a levitating field and floating away. I took the BEL, then used my levitation to make the broken wall weightless as I pushed it away. I dragged myself out from under the floating rubble when Pyrolite landed next to me. Calamity and Zenith not far behind. Calamity was dragging a huge sack full of weapons. From the Journal of Midnight Shower, Day 35. This is no holiday. For three days, Zebra Town has been like a ghost town for me. For three days, I have sought audience with the Constabulary, and for three days I have been denied. I know there are zebras here. I can see their shadows moving behind the windows. I spotted one zebra mare pulling her welcome mat inside before slamming and locking the door at my approach. Another hurried her fillies indoors. Her expression aghast as the foal attempted to smile at me. The horror. The horror. Enough is enough. I have an official decree from Princess Luna herself, and I'm going to wait outside the door until I am recognized. We waited at the bottom of the stairway for Calamity. Our Pegasus friend was using the gaping hole I had blown in the side of the police station to fly out and stash everything he and Zenith had taken from the vault. Calamity had been right. The prisoner was not in this part of the Zebra's Town police station. I had scouted the rest of it with Pyrolite after assuring my friends that I was not as bad off as I looked. We found a few medical boxes in the station's bathrooms and a few boxes of ammo, but no more alicorns and no zebra prisoners. They were all in the other section. To get to them, we had to cross the other section through the basement. Zenith drank one of the three healing potions we had scavenged, letting it work on the zebra zombie bite. She caught me watching her, and smiled. Fear not, little one. I will be fine. It is good that you cannot catch zombie from a bite, no? I nodded. Still, something in her expression felt off to me. You don't have to try to rescue them just because one of them is my daughter, nor because you feel you need to make it up for the cannibal town. Wait, did she actually try to talk me out of doing this? 
I turned my gaze to my zebra friend, asking cautiously, Are you alright with us doing this? What do you mean? She asked, not following my train of thought. Rescuing your daughter, I said carefully. You want to do this, right? Zenith glowed at me for a moment, but her expression softened. Yes, of course I do. I wish my daughter to be safe. Then, dropping her voice, she admitted. I just do not know if I am ready for this. What do you mean? Okay, this place was bad. There were all manners of ways to die here. But this morning I had seen Zenith leap from a flying passenger wagon onto the back of a bloodwing in an effort to save people. It didn't seem like Zenith was afraid to charge into danger with us. If I save her, Zenith says simply, I am responsible for her again. I remembered all those things I had dismissed as crazy zebra logic. But my friend, to my friend, they were not crazy at all. This is how things were in her world. And she was feeling cornered by impending responsibility that she did not believe she deserved or could handle. Zenith, we have to, I explained lamely. We can't let them die, even if rescuing them costs us something we aren't ready to give. I know that little one. It does not make this any easier. I nodded. Then try to put it out of your mind for now. Focus on what we have to do, and we'll deal with the consequences when they come. Climate returned. I unlocked the basement door, and I pushed it open with a hoof. The basement was full of pink cloud. Crap. I closed the door again, taking a few breaths. I looked at Calamity, Zenith, and Pyrelight. Ready for this? From the Journal of Midnight Shower, Day 36. I waylaid one of the constables as she attempted to sneak home after her shift. Cornered, Zebra Mare admitted that word had spread through town. Every zebra knew that I was in possession of star metal. Worse, they had somehow surmised that it was a fragment of Nightmare Moon's armor, which I had brought with me from Canterlot. I was immediately anxious, knowing that the proliferation of this information would put the valuable heirloom entrusted me in great danger of theft. The next word of the striped constable, however, revealed that the reverse was true. No zebra would be willing to venture close to the accursed chunk of meter metal, nor would they abide my presence due to my association with the heirloom. Insanely, in the zebra mind, my prolonged exposure means that I am somehow contaminated, as if I am contracted a dangerous, communicable disease. No stores will do business with me, and I am officially, unofficially, but quite effectively shunned. It's just a damn piece of metal. Thrusting my papers into the zebra's face, I dragged her back to the station and demanded that she felicitate, or felicitate, yeah, whatever, my access to the prisoner. I will admit that having been perhaps excessively loud and more physically forceful than is befitting a pony of breeding, but my efforts were provoked, did provoke a response. Finally, the head of the constable had opened the door, if only enough to poke his head out between the heavy chain that prevented me from forcing the door open further. He took one look at my papers and agreed to the authority they provided me, but regretfully informed me that the prisoner had slain himself two nights before and would not speak to anyone. Pony or zebra. I was not satisfied. I wanted to see the body for myself. I suspected that the zebra was lying, or worse, I suspected foul play to prevent me from speaking with the zebra captive. To my surprise, the head of the constabulary capitulated. He withdrew and closed the door. I could hear the chains being removed. When he opened it again, all the constables had left the room. I saw them watching in adjacent rooms like nervous foals peering into the darkness under the bed. The head constable led me through the Zebra Town police station, unlocking the door into the dimly lit stairwell. We descended, passing by a floor containing the normal cell blocks, and plunged further down until we were in a sub-basement where the iron behemoth of the boiler was held. 
Beyond it, across from the coal room, was a small room, no bigger than a closet, with a heavy iron door. Inside into the door was a small, barred window of thick glass, through which I could look into the shadowed chamber. I could see the prisoner. The zebras had not moved him. They had, I am inclined to assume, been unwilling to even open the door, much less share a space with the body of the striped inside. I could not make out the writing on the wall, but I immediately knew he had painted the scrawling letters in his own blood. I recoiled at my gaze as my gaze fell upon him, certain without doubt that the zebra had taken his own life in a fit of insanity. He had chewed through his own forehooves, continuing to gnaw, muzzle pressed into his own blood, until they were attached to his forelegs by only thin strips of meat. I have no idea what unholy drive allowed him to survive long enough to do the same exact thing to both of them. The cell was midway through the basement. By the time we had reached it, my heart was threatening to seize, and my lungs refused to work. My head was being ripped apart, and my flesh felt like it was being uh, trying to peel away from my meat. I couldn't make it to the far end of it, and I couldn't make it back, but the cell was free of the pink. All I had to do was unlock it. I fumbled, screaming in agony, and tried again. My companions pressed close, dying. This time, the door opened. We all stumbled inside. My torture melted away, but my EFF was flashing all the worst messages. Without healing potions, we couldn't go back out, and we only had two left. Two of us would have to stay behind, trapped in the cell until the others could get back from healing supplies. You two go ahead, Clamid rasped, waving a wing limply at Zenith and me. I opened my muzzle to argue, but he pushed it shut with his hoof. It's your mission more than mine, and it's only proper y'all should be the ones to see it through. Besides, you two are the best skilled for jailbreaking anywho. Zenith wobbled, looking stricken. No, it... When she stopped, her eyes glowing horribly wide, all the remaining color drained from her face and the skin beneath her coat. She wasn't staring at Calamity. Her eyes were locked in the wall behind him. I nudged past my Pegasus friend and looked at the wall. There were words there, scrawled in the rusty color of blood. But the words were strange. The letters... No language I knew. Zenith, what is it? A prophecy, she intoned, in the old language of our people. Swallowing. She slowly read, and tremble in her voice. By the light of our stars, we illuminate your end, and shine on the graves of all zebra kind. A hundred thousand nightmares will descend upon you. The armies of our dark child will fill the skies, and foes of impenetrable cities will fall upon all your lands. Shielded by armor, crafted from their very souls, rejoice with us. But every single one of you shall die. I froze, transfixed to the spot. A slow bubble of horror, horrified realization crawled up to my mind in the blackest of the abyss. The prophecy was wrong. It was a lie. But surely, as much as the zebras loathed anything they associated with the stars, surely a prophecy like this would have been gotten back into the zebras' Caesar, and the religious leaders of their land. I'd seen four stars. I knew they were zebra loyal to the homeland and ponies loyal to their cause. This would have gotten back. And when the zebras saw megaspells and alicorn shields, would they not have made the same assumptions as Fluttershy did about the, how the spells could be used to protect the entire cities? When they learned the Black Book had fallen into Rari's hooves, and even heard her suggestion using Soul Jarge to create invincible armor, would they be able to believe that she would abandon the project? How about the new Pegasi armor? And how would they react when they discovered that Twilight Sparkle, what she was up to? The prophecy was a tailor-made doomsday lie designed to drive the zebras to the worst possible extremes. But... 
How did the zebra know? How could he predict? Twisted and distorted things that were not even set into motion until after his death. The acquisition of the Black Book, in fact, was set into motion by his capture. How? Okay. It wasn't impossible. I had seen precognition level abilities before. Maybe the stars, or something, gave the zebra something equivalent to Pinkie Pie's unusual senses. Maybe it was some influence from the Black Book, or spells that had been woven into it after it was turned into a soul jar. Maybe the zebra had been on menthols, or something more potent than menthols. The zebras were the ones who created the drugs, after all, right? Or maybe. Maybe. Maybe it didn't matter. No. Not maybe. It didn't matter. The constables here had been so terrified of this insane zebra that they hadn't been willing to unlock the door to remove the body. I looked down. And sure enough, the skeleton was still there. The midnight shower hadn't been able to see the entire prophecy from the window. Perhaps no one ever did. It was entirely possible that there were the very first people to see the writing in the wall. And that was us. And the worst part was, it didn't matter. Even if this prophecy never made it out of this room, the zebras didn't need it. The Ministry of Magic had cracked the zebras' bright past magic just a few mere weeks before the end. And already, they were using it to create shields that only specific kinds of individuals could get through. Twilight Sparkle had been starting pony testing of the alicorn created IMP formula the very day of the strikes. Once those advances happened, it was only a matter of time before Equestria had impenetrable defenses and an army of advanced alicorn fighters, and the zebras would lose. The zebras had already lost. Equestria had won. It was only a matter of playing it out. Checkmate, and a predictable number of moves. And if the zebras truly believed that there was no other possibility for survival other than a s and no surrender, that they were facing annihilation, or worse, under Nightmare Moon, and they truly did believe that, then the only move left was to blow up the board. The zebras didn't see any other choice. From the Journal of the Night Shower Day 36, Addendum. I am almost finished packing. There is no point pursuing my research here. I will get no more cooperation of the zebras of Zebratown. To my dismay, not even Daisy will respond to my knocking, although I suppose she could legitimately be out of town. It doesn't matter. I have sent a message to head to Princess Luna, informing her of my failure and my imminent return. I have ordered a royal chariot to pick me up, just a few, just under two hours. That should be enough time to pack up this terminal, and last my possessions. I want to be rid of this place, and back on my own bed before midnight. And there is a knock on the door. It would appear my rise early. We'll have to wait. But I will not them wait, not wait, not make them wait long. Gah. And now they have upgraded their knocking to banging. Now I worry that Princess Luna is disappointed with me and wishes to, wishes to see me before I have time to pack. Or perhaps they have invitations to a sorte in Canterlot. And fear I will make them unfashionably late. Doesn't matter. I've decided that I don't actually need this lot of junk anyway. I can always buy new things once I'm back in this laps of society of reasonable ponies. Actually, I really need are those things already in the bags, as well as the heirlooms, lockbox, and this terminal. I'll be ready to go as soon as I'm finished writing this entry, and I have shut. Zenith and I gazed upwards. The entire stairwell of this building had collapsed. Taking a bit, a fair bit of each floor with it, we were at the nadir of a four-story pit, looking upwards through the ceilings where the floors used to be. Three floors up, 
We could see a jail cell, and the young adult zebra is trapped inside. Barely. The cell was behind a shield, being generated by two familiar dark green alicorns sitting in front of it like guards, unmoving, unblinking. On the floor above, three more alicorns stood watch. Well, at least the pink cloud hadn't seeped into this part of the building, and become trapped here. I was still getting nasty medical warnings on my EFS, despite having found a couple more healing potions in the constable's locker room, medical box, and embedded one. He neither drank the other. I felt slightly bad for not saving it, but by the time the two of us made it out of the basement, we couldn't have rescued any zebras. If we hadn't found those two potions, we would have needed rescuing ourselves. I really hated the pink cloud. Five alicorns. Fuck. I should have seen this coming. Alicorns normally work in groups of three. There were three in the other wing, one on the roof. That, mean at least, that meant at least two more. And five made even more sense. How the hell were we supposed to do this? There was no way of sneaking up to the cage, and we were hardly in prime fighting condition. I was working on a brilliant plan, and I had almost started one when I heard Zenith gasp. Zephyr! I eaped in surprise as Zenith's teeth bit down on my mane, and she threw me to her back. As Venus charged into view of the alicorns, shouting a battle cry. One after the other, the three alicorns ignited their shields and jumped down, swooping towards us. Zenith turned and ran, but not far. Hold on, little one. I wrapped my forelegs around her tightly, wondering what she intended to do. She spun, lowered her horn, and started charging to meet the closest alicorn as it sped towards her. You're kidding, right? At the last moment, Zenith leapt. The zebra sailed through the air, with me clinging to her back for dear life. Her hooves hit the alicorn's shield and pushed off of it, keeping momentum, leaping to the next, then the third. The zebra landed on the third floor, in front of the two green alicorns. I was still hugging her tightly, looking back down at the three utterly surprised alicorns, who had just been used at jumping platforms. Zenith reared and slashed her head into the one side of the other slicing her hellhound horn through the throats of the two alicorns in front of her. The shield dropped. Open the door, little one, she demanded. Hurry! I blinked, still feeling stunned, and slid off her back. I reached out for my magic, picking the lock to the door with casual ease. The alicorns below us were shaking off the surprise and soaring back towards us. Do you have any more of those memory orbs, little one? I nodded. Yes, but they won't fall for the... But these alicorns were cut off. They might just fall for the same trick. Stand back, I warned. Zena drove past me into the cell, pulling off her satchel and dumping its contents into the wide-eyed young zebra bucks and mares. As I floated out the memory orbs I had, I heard her say, The ones like this one, each of you take one and put it on. Swiftly. The alicorns were flying up at us, staring down through the ruins at them. I flung the memory orbs into the abyss, yelling, Bellfire eggs for every monster. Yay! The three alicorns scattered. Behind me, I heard the young zebra suddenly start crying out in sharp pain. I spun around, turning my back to the chasm in alarm. What? I stopped, stunned, yet again, not believing my eyes. And some of the zebras have magic fetishes that allow them to fly. Rarity's voice chimed sweetly into the back of my mind. Speaking to the three bucks harassing Rainbow Dash, if you think it's impossible for an earthbound pony mare to fly her way into Cloudsdale with the right magic, you have tragically short memories. All eight of the zebras in front of me, including Zenith herself, had grown large, bat-like wings. Wow, that's... When did you... My gaze fell to the strange talisman hanging from Zenith's neck, formed in part by an inhaler. 
and the identical ones worn by each of the other zebras, several of whom were still wiggling and writhing as their wings grew in. I realized what the blood wing strips were for. Xena smiled at me with feigning ignorance. You realize those are kind of creepy, right? I said, finally, smiling a touch. <laughs> Once again, I was riding Zenith's back. This time, my forelegs wrapped around her neck as her wings flapped to either side of me. Rain cascaded over us, soaking us both. The seven other zebras were soaring behind us. We had a slight head start, but none of the lot were anything more than most novice flyers. The same cannot be said for the three alicorns pursuing us. Oh my god. They swooped out of the zebra town police station behind us, tossing their shields up as soon as they went airborne. Bright light and thunder cracked through the air, and one of the zebras screamed as an alicorn lightning spell struck him. He fell from the sky, trailing smoke. No! I lashed out with my magic, grasping him in a telekinetic net and drawing him back towards us. But the young zebra was already dead. Whoosh! Twin missiles launched from somewhere in the zebra town ruins, striking against one of the alicorn shields. The monster turned her attention to steel hooves. The zebra town police station exploded. A blast tore upwards through the larger half of the police station, rendering the building apart. The force of the blast slammed into the three alicorns, causing their shields to fail and knocking one diving towards steel hooves out of the sky. The shockwave hit us, and Zenith lost control. Behind us, I heard Steel Hooves taking full advantage of the Alicorn's momentum, or moment of vulnerability. I threw my magic around Zenith, myself, and the six surviving zebras, pulling up, trying to soften the crash. We landed in the amphitheater lake, with a percussion of hard splashes. I gasped, struggling to paddle my way to the surface. No better at swimming than Velvet Remedy. My head broke the surface once, Barely. I sucked in a mixture of air and water as a wave hit across my muzzle. The last thing I saw was a swirling burst of green and gold flashing in the sky over where the Zebra Town police station used to be. You did what? Velvet Remedy shrieked. The rain had finally stopped, leaving the wasteland cool, gray, and wet. There were no rainbows, but the air had a fresh smell that was utterly pleasant. It was our second day back, and we had arrived late in the evening, just after the rainstorm ended. Our return was heralded with surprise and celebration amongst the zebras of Glyphmark, but we spent the night sleeping and the morning recovering, and metaphorically licking our wounds. I had wanted a funeral for the two zebras we had failed to save. But the glyphmark zebras didn't want to spoil the night, a first bright moment of their recent lives, with thoughts of mourning. Instead, we turned our efforts to helping this town in ways we could before we left. This time, I wasn't helping those in need, only to walk away. Clement looked up from the military robot he was repairing, and tipped up his hat. I blew up the big old boiler I had in the basement. Steel hooves walked alongside Calamity. Accessing the robot with his magically powered armor through a pitbuck technician tool I had borrowed to him. The Applejack's Ranger was reprogramming each of the robots in the Angel lot that Calamity could get working right, turning them into guards for the town of Glyphmark. Robot Remedy stammered, looking utterly aghast. Hey, I knew I could make it out of there through either of the two exits, but I figured I could make it out if the three yards from the cell with the boiler, throw all the right switches, and turn all the right knobs, and make it back to the cell before keeling over. He grinned sheepishly, adding, And you know, open the furnace up so Pyrelock could fly inside. Pyrelock cooed happily. Of a lot of us, she was the best for wear, having been nicely incinerated in a fire of her own making. Why? Well, I figured little Pip and Zenith had their saddles full, as it was, and we didn't want any pony getting dead trying to save us, Calamity explained. So, I thought, hey, a boiler explosion is most esteem, ain't it? 
and I seen how the rain washes away the pink cloud, so I reckon the steam explosion could clear the basement of cloud pretty quick. But you could have been killed. Well, the cell looked really sturdy. I figured it would hold. Calamity grinned, blushing. Of course, we got a hell of a bigger bang than I was expecting. Good thing the blast mostly went straight up. That's insane! Velvet Remedy stomped. Trapped between relief that Calamity was alive and the desire to strangle him for enacting such a reckless plan. The soft voice of Zephyr intoned. That is the friend of yours, whose name is Calamity, right? Zenith Troth Pat Calamity. With Zephyr and several other town zebras in tow. Her daughter stared at the Pegasus as they passed, and Calamity tipped his hat forward and bowed. Pleased to meet you, Miss Zephyr. <clears throat> Zenith was leading the group of zebras down to the into the labs beneath the Angel Bunny Pharmaceuticals. I wasn't sure about how I felt. Zenith teaching the town of Glyphmark to manufacture Dash. But it had given into her argument that the town needed something that they could sell to merchants in exchange for food and supplies. This was her way of trying to be responsible for them. We were losing Zenith, but only for a short while. She was going to stay behind in Glyphmark, spend some time with her daughter, and help the Glyphmark tribe while the rest of us tackled the Canterlot ruins. The Canterlot Ghoul paused in his work, looking up at Calamity. How did you know the boiler would still work? Kinda of counting on it not working right, actually. That's kinda of how you get him to explode. Clemity turned and hissed a pyrolite. I can't believe you would take part in something so... so insane. The Balefire Phoenix looked slightly abashed, but no less proud of herself. Velvet Remedy tossed her mane back, stuck her nose in the air, and harumphed. I listened to them, a smile on my face, then turned back to the zebras standing in line next to me. Each was wielding one of their own firearms. Clement had rebuilt from the mess of weapons we had scavenged from the police station's contraband vault. Now watch closely, I instructed, beginning their first lesson on marksmanship and firearm safety. They looked at me intently, eager to learn how to defend themselves and their town. For the first time in the goddesses knew how long, there was a sense of hope in Glyphmark. Footnote level up.